Matt, thank you very much. Uh, well, you'll find it useful to have uh, that section of Colossians open in front of you as we go through it. Uh, we'll be zooming in particularly on those last couple of verses, uh, so uh, do have those handy. But before we, uh, we get started, I'll pray and ask God to, uh, to help us as we try and get to grips uh, with the beginning of this book. Our Father, as we uh, begin uh, this uh, short journey through Paul's letter to the Colossians, we pray that you might help us in the things that we've just sung. We pray that we might uh, truly come to glory in the Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. We pray that he might own our love. We pray that we would be satisfied in him. And we ask in his name. Amen. When I was in my second year at university, I, uh, I met a guy who lived in a, a different block in the halls of residence I was staying in, and uh, we got talking over dinner one evening. We all ate dinner in a big hall with benches, and um, he wasn't a Christian, but he, w- he was quite a thoughtful guy, and he was interested in the big questions of life. And, but I told him I was a Christian during the course of the conversation, and he was interested in that as well. And he basically asked, so what's it all about? Which is a great question. What is Christianity all about? What is life all about? What would you have said? Where might you have pointed him? Maybe that's your question. While I was in Bible college, I did a a short placement at a church in Northern Ireland, and uh, I was introduced to a lady who'd uh, started coming to the church about a year before. She'd been seriously ill, and she'd been brought along by a friend who went to the church. And a few months later, she'd become a Christian. But now what? What would that mean for her life? How could she be sure that the the first experience she had of Christ had really taken hold? What does it look like to be a Christian? What does it look like to live as a Christian? What would you have said? Where would you have pointed her? Maybe that's your question. A number of years ago, I ran a Bible study group, and uh, one of the guys there was particularly keen. He was one of those people you, you just love to have in a home group. He, he'd been a Christian for a number of years. He, he was one of the most reliable and most enthusiastic members of the group. You, you knew it was home group week because he would turn up at your house. He was that regular. And he was very involved in church. He, he was solid. He was just good news. And he wanted to grow. He really did. He, he, how could he thrive as a Christian? How could he fight uh, successfully and gain ground against sin? How could he have a, a full Christian experience? How could he be confident that in his Christian life he, he really was headed in the right direction? What would you have said? Where might you have pointed him? Maybe that's your question. The more I've studied it over the past couple of months, the the more I am convinced that Colossians is a great part of the Bible for us to land in. It it takes us really to the heart of of all those questions and other questions like it. it. It's a letter that has vital things for us, regardless of where we are in relation to the Christian faith. Paul wrote this letter to a church in a a town called Colossae, which is in the the sort of southwest part of what we now call Turkey. And he he didn't plant the church. Actually, as far as we can tell from this letter, he'd never met them. Uh, they'd, uh, They'd heard the gospel originally from a guy called Epaphras, who was a friend of Paul. And Epaphras had started this church, and then he popped off to visit Paul, who was stuck in prison by this point. And Paul had then written this letter from prison. And and the church in Colossae, on the whole, was in pretty good shape. They'd not been Christians that long, but they were showing signs of of good spiritual health. They were trusting Christ. They loved each other. They had their eyes really set on God's promise of heaven. Paul had a lot of thank yous to pray once he'd had visiting hours from Epaphras. But Epaphras had also brought news of a, a potential problem. It seems that there were people around in Colossae who were teaching that there were certain practices and experiences that were really essential for anybody who who really wanted to know God and really wanted to experience God's. 
And the problem was those things weren't really related to Jesus in any real and essential way. Instead, actually, they were competing with Jesus for the the focus of your faith. They were competing with Jesus as the way to know God. They were calling into question, ultimately, the gospel that the Colossians had learned from Epaphras. Now, it doesn't seem like this teaching had made much progress in the church yet, but the danger is real, and so Paul writes this letter to shore them up. It's a bit different to some of his letters. Some of Paul's letters are really like setting off a fire extinguisher. You you read 1 Corinthians or you read Galatians and it's clear that there are massive problems. The place is on fire and Paul is writing the letter really to squirt gospel foam all over the problem. Colossians is not really like that. It's more like getting a flu jab. I'm sorry if that picture makes anyone squeamish. It won't be up for long. Uh, You you don't have flu at the moment when you go and get a jab, but the virus is around, and so you get the injection to make sure that you don't get infected and make sure that you stay healthy. And that's what's really going on with this letter here. Paul writes to the Colossians to encourage them and to reassure them in their Christian faith, to remind them that Jesus is the, the center of everything when it comes to knowing God now and on into eternity to expose the emptiness of these teachings that are flying around to remind them that Jesus is at the center of the Christian life well lived and to talk them through what the truly Christian life really looks like how to grow which is exactly what we need at whatever stage we we are at when it comes to the Christian faith. What is Christianity about? How do I live as a Christian? How do I thrive as a Christian? Colossians is just what we need. And a great summary, really, of everything the book is about comes in those last two verses we had. Chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. So then... Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. This is Colossians in OxoCube form, if you like it, the pocket guide to Colossians. If you're into memorizing bits of the Bible, memorize these two verses and you've really got Colossians in a nutshell. And this is where we're going to start this evening as we, uh, we just get acquainted with the book, as we start to get a flavor of the letter, as we start to get a flavor of uh, some of the answers to those questions we began with. And the first thing Paul says is remember that you started with Jesus. And he takes them back all the way to where things first began. In verse 6 he says, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, or uh, a bit more literally than that, just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord. If you've been around uh, churches and Christian things at all, you may well have come across uh, phrases a bit like that, uh, uh, receiving Jesus into your heart. Uh, receiving Jesus as your personal Lord and Saviour. And we sometimes use it as a sort of phrase to talk about uh, your experience of becoming a Christian. Uh, And that's not entirely off base. But it's not the sum total of what Paul is talking about uh, in verse 6. A few birthdays ago, somebody gave me one of those novelty travel towels. I don't know if you've ever seen them. They, they come in this tiny package about the size of a matchbox. And uh, they're really tightly compressed And the idea is that you get it a bit wet, and then you get a corner, and then you pull it out, and it expands into a little towel, a bit like that. And Paul's phrase, Christ Jesus the Lord, is a little bit like one of those towels when it's all wrapped up. Back in chapter 1, he really goes to town on who Jesus is, and on all the things he's done, particularly in salvation, and on the, the supremacy of Jesus over everything. And here, all of that is tightly packed into Christ Jesus the Lord. Jesus is the Christ. That is, uh, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, he is a king. He is the king that God has appointed over everything. 
And he is making everything new in creation, starting with his people through the gospel. And he is intent on bringing to heal everything that doesn't submit to him. And he's not just a king out of the blue, a king from no background and who just has enough of a following to suddenly swoop in and take over. Chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, he is the king that God was promising all the way through the Old Testament. The king who would gather people for God from every nation. The king who would free these people from their sins. The king who would lead his people in truly knowing God and truly loving God and truly obeying him. The king who would lead this united people into the joy of life with God forever. Jesus is the Christ. And he is the Lord. That is chapter 1 verses 15 through 20. He is truly in charge Everything that exists, exists because he he makes it so. Everything that carries on existing, including us, does so because he makes it so. He is over everything, and he is over everything that actually the, the Father is renewing through him. In fact, actually this Jesus has divine authority. When people were translating the Old Testament from Hebrew into, into Greek uh, around Paul's time, maybe a few decades before, they, they usually translated God's, God's special name as Lord. In chapter 1, verse 15, Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you want to know God, you look at Jesus. Chapter 1, verse 19, he says that all God's fullness dwelt in Jesus and now he calls Jesus the Lord Jesus is fully divine he has divine authority over everything Jesus is the Lord to receive Christ Jesus the Lord means to then to to understand who he is, to understand what he's done, to to have a grip on what he is doing, to to acknowledge those things, to accept it as truth, and then to submit to Jesus, to trust in him and follow him and love him. This is where we start when it comes to the Christian faith. This is what Christianity is about. We receive Jesus. Which maybe seems like a fairly obvious thing to say. But sometimes the things that we assume are are just a bit obvious to actually say out loud really do need to be said out loud. I was speaking to a lady some time ago and she'd had a a messy few years. She'd She'd lived a fairly wild lifestyle. She'd been in some bad relationships She'd been quite lonely and empty and and knew she'd been looking in the wrong places to deal with those things. And she was tired and she could see the, the damage that all these things had done to her. And she was wondering whether there was a different way. Whether Christianity might offer her a, a better and healthier and more stable life. And in an important sense, the answer is yes. Christianity heals and changes But that's not the heart of what it's all about. Christianity isn't fundamentally a philosophy or or merely a good way to live or, or one way to be happy and fulfilled. It's about Jesus. Jesus heals and changes and restores. A new and better life isn't because Christianity offers five key life skills and ten top tips for healthier relationships. It is because Jesus is the Christ, rescuing us from the power and the penalty of sin, making us new people, making us part of his kingdom. Christianity is about Jesus. And it is about Jesus who is Christ and Lord. This is the Jesus we are to receive. 
When I was a teenager, I went on uh, summer camps uh, similar to the ones that uh, some of the guys here run. And I remember a girl who came on the same one as me several years running, and she, she was interested in Christian things, but she was hesitant. She liked the, the kind, loving Jesus that she saw in the Gospels. She liked his good example. She believed that he could really offer some valuable direction for life. But she had real problems with the idea of Jesus the judge, Jesus the Lord. And there is a sense in which, actually, if that was true, she, she, she was right to be hesitant about the Christian faith. Because she saw what, what it requires of us. We don't receive a black and white outline Jesus where you can then fill in the color ourselves with whatever shades we prefer. We receive Christ Jesus the Lord. This is where we start. This is who we start with. You received Christ Jesus the Lord. And he is the center, actually, not of just where we start, but also of the growing Christian life. How are these Christians in Colossae going to grow and progress in the faith? What does living as a Christian look like? Well, Paul says... Keep going with Jesus. Verse 6, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, or more literally, uh, walk in him. Jesus is where we start, and he is how we go on. Uh, back at the start of the passage we had read, chapter 128 to 2 verse 5, Paul, Paul lays out the, the end point of, of all that he's striving for in, in all Christians He's striving for mature, united believers who will finally stand before God complete. And this is how you get there. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. But the idea of walking in him is, is it's to do with how we go through life. What drives your way of life? What drives the way you speak, the way you behave, the things that you make a priority and are, are really important to you, how you go about making decisions? If you're going to be a Christian and thrive as a Christian and finally reach God's great heavenly inheritance, then our lives must be shaped and driven by Christ Jesus the Lord. When I was a teenager, for a while, it was um, sort of fashionable to wear little wristbands that had uh, the letters WWJD printed on them. And WWJD stood for, what would Jesus do? And the idea was that the wristband, you'd wear the wristband and uh, you'd probably see it fairly often. And it would act as a useful reminder in your daily life to, uh, to, to follow Christ. Uh, maybe those situations where you might be tempted to act in uh, ways that weren't really consistent with your Christian faith. Now it's a bit gimmicky and you get that awful Christian merchandise thing going on with it and maybe you might want to tweak the question a bit. But it's not far off what Paul is talking about. We go on in the Christian life by becoming more and more Christ-shaped, moulded by who he is and what he did for us at the cross and his commands and where he's taking the world. The Christian life is about Christ. Walk, uh, continue to live in him. Which again, maybe seems a bit obvious to say. But I think it's possible for us to go wrong here. The Christian life is not finally about following a bunch of rules. There certainly are commands. Paul would give a whole list of them later on. But it's not simply a tick list of do this, don't do that. Where a frowning vicar and finally a frowning God are just waiting to wrap your knuckles when you fall out of line. It's about following Christ in the light of who he is and what he has done for us and what he is doing with his world. The Christian life is also not about uh, walking in uh, other Christians you know. It's possible sometimes that we, think, uh, we find ourselves thinking that if we're going to be a good Christian, then we need to be just like 
uh, the other Christians in church or maybe the person who told you the gospel or, or the person who's just been really influential in your Christian life thus far. And so we think actually that living as a Christian involves talking in the same way as whoever. Same jargon, same tone of voice or liking the same things, or having the same hair, or buying the same clothes from the same shops, or liking the same music, or having the same political views, or wearing the same wristbands. It's a good idea to follow somebody's good example, but only as far as they show us Christ. We are to walk and live in Christ. Now, Paul's going to unpack uh, later in the letter the the nitty-gritty detail of what it means to walk in him. But here, he just starts to get us us going with the four details you get in in verse 7. Walking in him means, firstly, being rooted in Christ. Uh, This is uh, really what we've been talking about already. Uh, It's about where you've settled uh, you, in the original language, the word describes a state, a, a situation that already is, if you like. Uh, you become a Christian, you're living the Christian life, so your roots are in Christ Jesus the Lord. He's where you're anchored. He's where you get everything you need to keep on growing. He is where everything grows up from. Secondly, then, walking in him means being built up in Christ. Paul switches TV channel here from Gardner's World to Grand Designs, if you like. He he pictures a a building site and the building going up. And it stays a building site for quite a while if you've ever watched one of these these things. But you do see the building progress. The girders go up, the bricks get laid, the cladding goes on, the interior gets done. And the same is true with the Christian life. We are to be built up in Christ to know him better, to grow more devoted to him, to love him more, and so to to think and speak and live in ways that are more and more in line with what he says is right. We don't grow up in something else. It won't be a particular experience that you just have to have to take you to the next level in the Christian life. It won't be some spiritual technique recommended by your favorite writer or TV personality. It won't be those extra rules, which, in all honesty, that you start out with, and they're quite useful as uh, as encouraging you to stick with Christ. And somehow, over time, they morph into this, uh, this orthodoxy where actually this is really what real Christians do. And if you don't do it, you're really teetering on the edge. We will only be truly built up in him. Thirdly then, walking in him means being strengthened in the faith. That is, getting an increasingly deep grasp about the the truths about Jesus and surrounding Jesus. For us, the faith means the the teaching of the Bible, the, the body of teaching about Christ, particularly the gospel. Now, we all come, to, come into the Christian life with a, a true but a, a limited grasp of those things. We, we know enough to trust Christ truly. But there is plenty more to get hold of, plenty more depths to plumb. How exactly did Jesus rescue me when he died on the cross? Exactly how serious is my sin? What exactly does it mean that we have been reconciled, as Paul will say elsewhere? How did Jesus do that? What exactly have I been rescued from? What exactly is the heavenly hope stored up for his people? Now you could give one sentence answers to all those questions. And you could read a shelf full of books and still find that there's stuff you didn't yet know. The better we get to grips with these things, uh, the more solid, the, the more established we become in the faith. And the more devoted to Jesus we get. And the more we trust him. You see, if you're a Christian, a part of uh, walking in Christ it, it involves delving into the faith. 
that we're not free to simply stand still in a simple faith. If we are happy just drifting along in the Christian life, it, it is a sign that there's something wrong. We should be growing in our grasp of Christ Jesus the Lord, not so that everybody gets a PhD or something like that, but growing. It is not beyond us. It is effort. But it's for our eternal good. Unless we fear that you, uh, you read a few books and you just end up with a whole bunch of dry and dusty information, Paul reminds us that then this then leads into a fourth thing. It leads into overflowing with thankfulness. You see, true knowledge of the faith, true strengthening doesn't lead, lead to dustiness or big-headedness or using really long words just for the sake of it. It leads to thanksgiving. You get a great example back in chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Paul is praying for the Colossians at that point, and he prays that they would be giving thanks to the Father, and then he unpacks why they might be doing that. And he says, This Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption. The forgiveness of sins. You might prayerfully pick your way through each of those phrases detail by detail, chewing over exactly what God has done for us in Christ. It would be good for your strengthening, it would be good for your thanksgiving. It is all about Christ. Just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, for all that he is for all that he reveals to us for all that he has done for us we pray that you might work in us that you might root us in him that we would be strengthened in the faith that we would overflow with thanksgiving and we ask in his name and in his strength amen